and we're live. So establishing two points, dragging connection between those two points, moving the entire arm adding to a line if we feel like it, if we want to make closure, if we want to make connections, and we're okay with overlapping. The great thing about overlapping is it actually builds the confidence in the line. If you don't overlap, then, then there's maybe some hesitation as to whether you're connecting or not. And so overlapping just gives you a little bit of release. Less in, it's less intimidating. So once you're okay overlapping, then you're, the line actually becomes more confident. So I'm just going to close these now in, into a series of, of rectangles and squares. These are going to become areas that we're going to add some things to them. But this is an exercise you can do almost anywhere. I've, I've done it on napkins, <laughs> in restaurants. I've done it during telephone conversations. Telephone conversations are great. <laughs> you can do all kinds of sketches during telephone conversations. Three or four years from now, folks will ask me, what are telephone conversations? What are those? <laughs> a friend of mine has a, uh, they have a eight-year-old in Maryland and uh, she saw her first public phone the other day. <laughs> Had not seen one before. You can imagine how that conversation went. <coughs> well, you put a coin into it, and then you can make a telephone call. <laughs> can you imagine the questions that came from that? Isn't it? But why would you want to use this phone where well, everyone else has touched it? Well, there's a certain idea behind going over a line because the motor skill of, of going over a line over and over and over again actually is teaching your brain to, to sort of be confident in, in, in the straightness of a line. So just keep working there until you get a really fun kind of grid system going on. Remember that establishing the two points first can sort of map out and tell your brain where to go and help establish relationships of parallel lines and perpendicular lines. It's quite a big a bit of cognition just right there in establishing or making a grid. Your brain is actually doing a lot of work to do that. That's why we're here. <laughs> All right. So once we get a few, few of those, now we're going to start filling them in with stuff. We're going to we're going to practice some standardized 
textures and patterns. Sterilized textures and patterns that start to become representative of different materials in the built and natural environment come from the tradition of drafting, believe it or not. Some of these patches, patterns, come from traditional drafting, so representations of concrete, representations of other things. They're also more cognitive exercises of squiggly lines, parallel lines, and the like. These come directly from Paul Asso's book, Freehand Sketching. These, uh, these are found in other uh, books on sketching and drawing. Uh, so, so take a look at these examples up here. You can see a series of, of parallel lines, squiggly lines, dashed lines, cross hatching, uh, multiple directional hatching, row hatching, uh, a lot of different things. Some, some of these are loops, okay, loops or, or Cs. Here's, here's the letter L that's representing <coughs> the tile pattern. Right? So there's a lot of the, those different things. So just take a look at some of those there and make kind of make reference to what's there and start to fill in some of those squares now with some of the patterns that you can see there. So I'm going to take out my fine liner and I'm going to now start to replicate the pattern, one of those patterns, one of those textures that I see there. Now this is a different part of the motor skills. This is now these textures, these small dots, these small circles, these small loops, these small hatches. These are more, right, the motor skills involved in the fingers and in the wrist. That's not necessarily the entire arm. And so these are, these are different now. We're probably resting now on the palm or the pinky itself and we're replicating, trying to make rows of these things as well as create some variation across them. We don't want them to all look the same. We want some variation in these things to give our viewer just kind of the impression of a random or natural surface or texture. So this is now activating a different type of motor skill. If the lines were activating a motor skill involved the entire arm, this is now starting to activate the motor skills of the fingers and the wrist. So I'm going to try out a couple of my different fine liners here and just pick out a couple of these different, <coughs> different textures to replicate. So we've got some squiggly parallel lines. And again, you know, this is a full 8.5 by 11 page, but you can do this anywhere, right? In any size sketchbook, cocktail napkin, sales receipt, margins of a notebook. These graphic calisthenics will become, hopefully, just an extension of your lifestyle. Graphically and otherwise. Go with a sort of a diagonal overlapping hatch for this one. And this essentially is this is basically just a wiggle. I'm I'm leaning on this side of the palm and I'm just wiggling the arm. So again, these came from Paul Asso's freehand sketching book, but you'll see examples of this in James Richards' book, Chip Sullivan's book. Drawing the landscape. These texture exercises are part of a lot of compulsory drawing and sketching situations. This is a multi directional hatch. challenge here cognitively is to try to randomize <laughs> the direction and overlap of these hatches. It actually can be quite challenging. That's the idea. 
the ability to cover an area with a shade or texture quickly. So it's cognitively challenging us. with different parts of the brain and different exercises with the hand. Okay? How you doing? I just the letter L over and over again. Just a vertical hatch pattern, just back and forth, just moving the fingers and the wrist. Totally different motor function. <coughs> Repetition, boundary, stop and go, change direction, different motor skills. Repetition is not something that comes easy to us, and so we're actually tuning the brain to sort of look, see, react, and try to replicate a specific motor function. So again, these different parts of your brain are working together now to communicate to your arm and hand to create these textures. kind of look like rows in my parents' garden now. <laughs> this is where we would plant the corn and the tomatoes and the beans and the squash. <clears throat> you can make up your own sort of thing. These can become part of the doodles of your life. <laughs> you know, different notebooks. We've got an interesting sort of stop-go, stop-go pattern right here. Sort of a lot of stop-and-go, sort of dashed dots and dashes. Maybe it's a Morse code or a cry for help or something like that. SOS, SOS. But this type of page or this type of exercise, this type of pattern, you can 
you know, in different parts of your life, you can now start to exercise two very different types of sketching motor functions, whether it be the execution of the lines or the implication of texture. You also get to know your pens really well. So I, if I switch up between the different pen brands that I've got here, each time I do these, the, the pen will teach me, will tell me what it can do and what it can't do or what it doesn't want to do. So it's just a great way just to get to know your media in terms of their limitations and pressures and different line weights and things like that. All these brands behave very differently. And so this is a great way to get to know your media and start over time to develop your favorite brand name. And next thing you know, you'll be ordering these by the case. <laughs> Professor Egging had a popular pen, I mean, a very favorite pen in the late 90s. And when he heard that they were going out of production, he, he ordered uh, six cases. And so, <laughs> just to make sure he would have enough for a few years. Or if I, if I go to, to Blick, to the Dick Blick store, it's just called Blick Art Supplies now in Chicago, and I'll try different things out, and I'll just get really excited about a new brand or a new style of pen. Pilot makes a permanent ink fine liner now, and so what I discovered is that I could draw in my sketchbook with the lines first and I could watercolor over them. So that got me really interested and excited. So I ordered several boxes of those. And now we're carrying those in the CRC as well. different ones. We've got a few, a few zigzags, we've got a few peaks and valleys, we've got a few dots, a few ovals, a few circles. So some different ones to try. I'll continue to add those to my matrix here. Well, these were where they're all kind of the same size. These are tiny little circles or loops. So there's a couple of these here where they're actually different sizes. Just until we can fill in the entire square. Interesting thing about rows of these things is how do they interact with each other? How do they line up? Where are the gaps? Do the gaps line up or not? What is the nature of the negative space? Your brain is actually processing all of that as you draw these. You're like, oh, wait a minute, there's a gap here. I should fill that in, or, or not, or I should celebrate that, or. Some wavy lines here. 
Wavy lines are actually really challenging because you have to react to the line ahead of it. Almost takes on a, almost a topographic kind of quality to it. But not only you have to, you're challenged to, to draw a parallel line, but you're also now starting to draw and pay attention to the space in between lines. Again, that's a different cognitive function. And so this exercise does start to train you on the careful execution of space in between the lines. Sometimes it's not the line, it's what's matters is what, what is matters is, is what is in between the lines. <coughs> so again, these exercises challenge you, challenge your brain to start to think in that way. Pointillism. Another cognitive sort of exercise. The cognition of pointillism is interesting because you are now really concentrating on the space in between the dots. It's the frequency of the dots and it's the space in between the dots that give pointillism its overall look. Obviously, higher concentrations of dots mean a denser surface. An even concentration of dots implies an even surface as opposed to a curved surface or a shaded surface. There's quite a bit of cognition happening just when you're executing pointillism. Higher concentrations of dots might mean something different than lower concentrations of dots. That will start to communicate something about the surface or texture in the drawing. Close this gap. We go for one of these. I'm looking for variation. I'm looking for space in between. I'm looking for repetition of the scatter or the squiggle. This is all teaching me that brain-to-hand coordination. A traditional diagonal hatch. wavy hatch. Yeah, switch it up. Leave some negative space. Look at it from a couple different ways. Take some time now and just finish up. <clears throat>